Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to yet another panel. On this panel, we are going to discuss the rule of law. We're so happy to have so many of you, ladies and gentlemen, here in the audience and online. Let me introduce my panelists. Professor Anna Wabno. Professor Wabno is a member of the Legislative Council at the University of Śląsk at the Department of Law. We have Professor Marcin Wiącek, uh, Ombudsman. He is a lecturer at the University of Warsaw. And for a number of years, he has been member of the Legislative Council and uh, Court of Justice um, member and an expert on the Constitution. Thank you for being with us. Also, Professor Sadurski is with us. Professor, can you hear us? Welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Professor Sandurski is a former professor of the uh, University of Florence. He's the University of Warsaw professor as well as philosophy of law professor at the University of Sydney and editor in chief of Sydney Law Review. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Also, by phone, Professor Waldemar Gontarski. Welcome, Professor. Hello. He is an attorney, rector of the European School, Higher School of Law and Administration, plenty potentially of the government for issues at uh, the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, above all, I would like to invite you to interact with other panelists. Interventions during other panelists' time is possible so that we can make this discussion more dynamic. Uh, that's uh, kindly, uh, that's, that's possible, so we are kindly invited to do that. Uh, professor, do we have a definition of the rule of law? And is it an issue of law or politics? How do you see that? Definitions are always risky, particularly in law. I wouldn't say there is a definition, but definitely there is some kind of imagination of what rule of law is and what it should be. And this allows for confrontation with reality and verification, which is a basic issue. That is, we need to have an idea and imagination of what kind of law we want to have and uh, what system we want to operate within. And this is part of our understanding of um, rule of law. And that understanding is an idea of law as it should be in accordance with our vision. It's up for discussion because it's the issue of uh, the other. It has to be confronted. So it should be an idea about law, what kind of law we would like to have, how it should be formulated, how it should work, and how it should organize our life within what limits, why, and with what outcomes. And this has to be an issue for discussion, both in law, that is, a discussion in a group of experts, as well as in a group of all the actors or the parties or the groups that want to be organized within a social system. Without that, I cannot imagine the creation of any kind of legal system or state system. While we have circles involved of all kinds, different professions, different axiologies, 
In such case, somebody might say it's um, idealistic. And yet, in the space of operation of state systems operation, and Poland hand can boast many centuries of such operation, we can create concepts, verify them, and try and apply them. Whether it's more a realm of politics or law, that's a difficult question, because law is political, whether we want it or not. It's the question of uh, degree to which we can detach norms from political conditionalities, the difficult in a system in a society that's unstable, uh, unorganized, disorganized, without elites worked out that can demonstrate certain needs and solutions. In such a case, indeed, rule of law can be directed too politically. But I do not believe in a possible situation in which law is um, um, detached uh, from politics. Because if we want to have a certain vision of common good, then the rule of law will be directed differently. This is a complex issue, and it's worth discussing. Let's take our situation and the situation of the 20th century and the 30 years of free Poland. It's an issue of what kind of state we want to have, how we understand law, and what its function should be, in our opinion. Without such a discussion, it is impossible to build whatever, anything that would be satisfactory in terms of people's needs, while well, that's what law is about. But first, you have to start with a vision. Well, such vision, the question is whether it's there. That's why we have this kind of discussions, and it would be nice for this today's discussion to be a start of a discussion about the shape of the Polish state. We haven't had such a discussion in the 30 years. One of the basic questions would be about the rule of law, what uh, message should be embedded in the Constitution. Let's see. Let's look at Hungary. That's where we have a real national identity and the Constitution from the very start, from square one, has been raising doubts across Europe. So I think this is a question, an opening question for this discussion asked by our moderator. And I don't think it can be easily answered in a brief speech. But I think it's worth looking into, discussing, analyzing. Thank you. We heard that law cannot be detached from politics because politics is, after all, about caring about the common good. So law has to be political. Professor Ombudsman, I worked at your office um, years and years ago. At um, then ombudsman, in turn, then we talked about uh, the um, human rights, and now we are continuing the discussion about human rights in the Polish, disc the Polish Constitution. So I'm wondering, is Constitution being moved to a um, to the background of the whole discussion? So is it about the relationship between the European law and Polish Constitution? Where are you as ombudsman looking for inspiration for human rights in the Constitution or European law? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. I am of the opinion that uh, the prevailing law uh, in the Republic of Poland and the main source of uh, human rights in Poland is the Constitution. And it's the Constitution that governs as a source of law in Poland. Polish constitution provided for the possibility of joining international structures which are based on treaties. 
I think of our membership in the European Union as well as in the European as the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe and the European Union and the United Nations, they have their own treaties that uh, set out some rights and obligations. And there is an assumption that these acts, these treaties, protecting human rights on the European level and on the universal level, they are consistent with the catalog of uh, rights and liberties that stem from the Polish Constitution. And here I would like to put it, to make it explicit that they are subordinate. So international treaties like the uh, Charter of Human Rights or UN Pacts or uh, Law of the European Union, they are predominant only and they have they are prevailing over acts of law but not constitution. So it seems there is some discrepancy in that respect. So there are some liberties and rights which are not directly enumerated in the Constitution, but they are enumerated in the acts of international law. For example, nebis in idem, so avoidance of double punishment. It's not expressly written in the Constitution, but it stems from the European Charter of Human Rights. And we have much, many more such examples, like, for example, the right to the clause of conscience. It is not embedded in the Constitution. This is um, just an interpretation of the Constitution and the Charter. European Charter of Human Rights said it and provides for it in an explicit manner. So to sum up. The specter of uh, protection of liberties and rights in Poland and people subject to the Polish jurisdiction, there, there are many acts like that, especially the provisions of Article 2, the, uh, the catalog of constitutional rights. But based on the Constitution, Poland is within given international structures that have their own uh, treaties which relate to human beings and they are an additional source of liberties and rights. But in principle, in many cases, these international sources of protection of liberties and rights, they extend uh, the scope of liberties and rights of human rights, which are provided in the constitutions, but for formal reasons, they are subordinate to the Polish constitution. So you encourage me to speak, but that is related to something what I've said about the rule of law, because if we were to regulate everything in every constitution, which is the tradition of the judicial uh, Tra judicial culture, we wouldn't be able to formulate such a catalog. It will be longer um, and we it couldn't be written. So everything depends on the way we apply a given act of law, especially constitution. Are we able to add something which is not written there, but which results from its general provision? And in such a case, in case law and in the culture, they are the source of law and these are unwritten sources of law, which also in are applied in case law. And if we contradict them and if we object them and negate them, so what is the source of this negation? Why are they rejected? And this is the problem. Why within one judicial council uh, culture we want to negate some of them 
let's move forward to the question uh, to Professor Sadurski. Dear Professor, can you hear us? So, thank you very much for joining us. A dilemma with the Constitution and the European law is only a step before the question, what are we dealing with? We have the discussion over the European law prevailing over the, the Polish law and the Constitution. And the question is, are we heading in the direction of a federal state? So what should be the position of Poland? Should it be just the powiat of the European Union uh, with uh, the capital uh, in Brussels? Because the United States were formed because of unification of that and creation of the Supreme Court as the uh, very last orbiter for uh, setting, settling disputes between the American citizens. So do you perceive this dispute in the same manner? Are we talking about uh, us heading the federal law when we agree for the European law being dominant over the Polish law? I don't think anyone is, has said a word uh, about uh, the, um, the European law prevailing over the Polish law apart from real fundamentalists. So as the ombudsman said, in Poland, the situation is quite simple and clear when it comes to the hierarchy of the sources of law. And the constitution is, of course, the first. But all the disputes and all the commotion between uh, Brussels, uh, Luxembourg, Strasbourg, and Warsaw, they do not stem from the fact that Constitution is not in line with the treaties. And we need to ask ourselves the questions, what's the most important, a treaty or a constitution? No. In no way. Constitution didn't prove insufficient or incompliant with regard to the European law, the European Charter of Human Rights, or when it, uh, or in case of the uh, Council of Europe, the European Charter of Human Rights. Exactly. So the contradiction is between the Polish law and the Polish uh, case law. The acts, so called a set of judicial uh, reforms of 2017 on the National uh, Court, um, on the National Judicial Council, and uh, the Common Courts, uh, they introduced submission and subordination of courts to executive powers and to the public prosecutor and the Minister of Justice. So these are all acts of law. And if there was a real and independent a constitutional tribunal in Poland, all these acts would be redeemed. They would be canceled due to different maneuvers. And I will not remind you of them. That possibility wasn't used. So the real conflict is between uh, the acts of law and case law, which is uh, which has no legal foundations very often, as it uh, was recently on the Polish and Belarusian border, because we have the ordinance and non-constitutional act and the emergency, the state of emergency, and constitutions and the European treaties. On the other hand, so the European treaties put it straightforward, and they, they provide for human rights, rule of law, democracy, and the rights of minorities, also ethnic minorities, and it is specified in Article number 2. They tell about legal uh, protection, efficient legal protection, and they tell how the European Union should react to the countries that are in violation of this act in Article 7. So all these articles of the treaty on uh, the European Union are completely convergent with the Polish constitution. And I 
didn't find in the Polish constitution any basis for politicization of the National Judicial Council and for creation of this uh, little institutional monster, which is the disciplinary chamber and the whole system, the cancer-driven cancer system the degenerative system at all levels of the judicial system. So I cannot find any justification for creation of the uh, chamber for extraordinary um, supervision, which would be appointed by the uh, same majority that will evaluate the um, uh, the, the, whether the elections uh, were rigged or not. In, uh, so we had to do with the attempt to colonization of state by the governing party. And this is anti-constitutional and anti-treaty. And that's my main answer to your questions. But if we were to reflect whether European Union is heading towards federation and whether Poland is going to become a voivodeship or a poviet of the European Union with a capital in Brussels, so this is our just a, a p word play and this is maybe good for journalists. But they didn't, I couldn't see any symptoms of that. You've mentioned the United States. Let me remind you that in the United States, it's not like that, that any state is a monarchy, another one is a republic, and another one is um, secular, and other has some state religion or is a religious state. No. And in the European Union, we have the whole array of different democracies, monarchies, uh, secular countries, and religious countries as well. We have federal states and unitary states as well. We have countries with uh, strict control uh, over um, of the constitution and with the parliamentary supremacy, and there are no symptoms indicating that anyone would tell to the Swedish to become a republic, for example. So let's be serious. The European Union is no federation and there are no single there is no single symptom of heading in this direction. Of course they want to have a closer integration on the economic level and on the level of some legal settings and climate change, environmental protection or human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear professor, for your take. Valdemar Kontarski has joined us on the phone, and we'd like to ask you, dear professor, what's your uh, opinion about what you've said? The last words of uh, Professor Wojciech Sadurski is there are no um, unification on the level of system. So cultural and political systems are maintained and they should be maintained. And Professor Wojciech Sadurski said it quite clearly. So my question is, in a situation where in Germany the Supreme Court is appointed by 32 politicians directly in Spain, the National Judicial Council is appointed by the parliament, so also by politicians. So is it really so that the system in Poland where the National Judicial Council is partly appointed with the majority of three-fifths of votes, which are not in hands of the governing party, of the ruling party, it's not the Supreme Court, isn't, is it really the a real subordination of the judicial system and judicial independence? to politicians, shouldn't we uh, take care of our constitutional sovereignty, dear professor? 
Ladies and gentlemen, I have a optics like German literacy, like G German literature. So with regard to what Professor Sadurski said and to contradict it, according to the German uh, documents, there, it is a federation which is not expressed in treaties, but which takes this form of federation uh, via European institutions. So, author show, for example, what does he say about uh, the um, the Court of Justice? This is an institution of the European Union and before of, of previous unions, and this is the fact. Or let's take a resilience uh, and um, recovery instrument that was discussed last year, the unification of that when the consequence of that and repayment um, in um, in time what does the german literature tell about that this is an unexpressed monetary union which is not expressed in treaties and even more dogmatic contradictory to treaties especially if we take a look at the decisions taken by the court of justice we can see a mention that it's a group of countries and that the the federal constitutional court in Germany said that federal states cannot, that this is a union of federal countries, federal states. I'm sorry, uh, this is a union of sovereign countries that hand over management over their sovereignty under treaties. If there were some competences, if the EU institutions would, if the states could express they, and define their competences, that would be a real federation. But I would like to speak from my position as an advocate. Every year I try to um, avoid some expressions. For example, if it, if it would be supposed to be the public law, OK, there is the pri private and public law. But political law, this is something really toxic for law. A subtle discussions started about what's most important, the Constitution or the European law, and the lawyers tried to find to get a clue there and another key if advocate another lawyer comes and say no this is the primacy of and primate of politics over law the whole dispute over the rule of law with Poland that is managed by the European Commission but uh, we had the uh, prejudicial uh, request also before it was also related to the Portuguese law and let's see the setting in which this ruling was uh, issued the Portuguese uh, lawyers and judges helped the Polish judges. So this uh, decision was taken also having Poland on mind, and I accept that view. So what, how, what do we read in the ruling? Based on Article 19, Section 2, independently on how a national court operates, the tribunal can issue a decision. But the general ombudsman, when issuing the ruling uses the English version, but the Polish translation was presented as well in the meantime. So, for example, we had this example that uh, 
Professor Tuleya's requests were left without any response, and I sent because the plenipotentiary of government is entitled to do so to um, to prepare their stance in advance that makes translators' lives easier. And they say that the ombudsman uses a bad translation of the Portuguese ruling uh, uh, versus the, in the English version, official version, and they should and they should, and it appeared that the Portuguese version was like the Polish version, and translators said that do you want, and asked me, do you want to tell it? Because that will end in some crisis, because they verified different language versions, and they said that I was right. So they started to think why the interpretation to Portuguese and to Polish of this English um, ruling is different. Why it is different? Was there is a difference of in versions? And uh, we tried to find out why. So the tribunal applies Article 5, uh, Section 19.2. And it sets out a law for effective legal measure. So this is totally different law than the right to independent court. And what is said by the Charter? That the Charter does not extend the EU competence. So a simple question. As a simple advocate, why the European treaties don't mention independent of a judge? In the judge independence was something that was known to the founders, to the creators of treaties. They were negotiated before the Lisbon Treaty. There was the Convention on the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Rights, and in the preamble, uh, that should the uh, independence of judges was mentioned. So that's why I would put forward a thesis that for some time the EU institutions pretend to protect rule of law because we have different terms to name it, but generally it means the rule of law and the tribunal uh, treats uh, it as a rule of law, something which is uh, also um, translated into Polish as the Sada Rządów Prawa. So it is, of course, related to the independence of judges, and we can hear that it has been established uh, in case of uh, forest. But during that treaty, they quoted, during that case, they quoted treaties. And the tribunal added one competence to the catalog. So they just specified the amount, although the penalty should be imposed for decision which was not implemented, and it was not the case. And later with Turów, and with the disciplinary chamber, the vice president of tribunal imposes a penalty, a decision on penalty, and at the same time they accept the Polish side appeal because in regulation there is a possibility to appeal to present new circumstances. And in case of Białowieża Forest case, it didn't apply. And in case of Turów and in case of disciplinary chamber with imposition of financial penalties, the first vice president has analyzed the Polish appeal despite the fact that uh, Poland applied for something different. So both the financial penalties imposed due to non-performance of decision and the construction of Article 19 
Item two, they indicate that pretending and under the cover of protection of rule of law, the rule of law is um, violated. So my appeal is more dogmatic analysis and less uh, politics, because otherwise we end up not with question not only whether the European treaties are dominant over constitution, but we get to the to that whether the whether it's not the politics that governs. And this is my opinion as a simple advocate. Thank you very much, dear Professor Professor Wabno. Yeah, at Vassen, I do not postulate. I and I wouldn't do it to politicize law. But the fact is like it is. The law is instigated by politicians. So there might be some problems related to that fact. And there are some relations. Of course, the question is what kind of relations and how to counteract any political abuse in law. Because I agree that I agree with a professor that the primate of politics has different negative impacts, but we cannot leave politics aside. It's not possible because the whole parliament is politicized. If we take a look at constitutional courts, they are related to politics. Of course they are. And if we operate and if we concentrate on real um, uh, events, we still stay at some level of abstract. That's why I mentioned these relationships, because I can say that the rule of law this is a rule of law. It's a great definition, but what stays behind that? What stands behind that? And the, what stands behind it? We explained that with Professor Gontarski. So depending on where we discuss and what is the topic of discussions, there are some problems emerging and this is something really difficult. And this is the essence of this difficulty. I would add one thing. The union has some problems. We have some problems due to the level of politicization. In Poland, we get into trouble. And if we analyze this problem, it would appear that this political aspect causes that the uh, judge uh, issue the ruling it, it issue, they issued. So we are talking with our um, perception of the rule of law. We say, no, it's beyond uh, our perception. And in the European Union, they can imagine something like that. Of course, this is a matter of politicization. I'm sorry that I'm... I'm so straightforward, but this is how we should arrange it in order to have the clear image. So um, a judge gave decision devoiding uh, many households of healing. So it's not a humanitarian decision. It's not only a matter of rule of law, but it's about real human decency. Dear Ombudsman, dear Professor, because we've uh, heard from Professor Gontarski, a quite straightforward stance with regard to the uh, practice and decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So they, uh, politics is more important for them than law. They add some and use some competence that are not assigned to them. And this, this is a question I wanted to ask the dear ombudsman whether about the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. Maybe they should act as a guard and they should uh, stand on the side of these households risking no access to heating before winter. So in many European member states, um, the decisions of Court of Justice of the European Union are under discussion. And what is your perception of the role of the Polish Constitutional um, Court? Shouldn't it become the last resort for citizens who feel limited, discriminated uh, with some um, bad decisions of uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union that uh, abuses its competences and uh, um, takes the heat out of them. Yeah, so maybe let me refer to that, that this initial decision issued by the European Court of Justice, um, they were not, it was not based on the right values. And it didn't take into account 
how important it is, uh, how important the um, power plant in Turov is for, uh, for functioning of many households and for energy s safety in Poland. And uh, something it can, maybe they didn't think what will be the immediate result of uh, switching over this uh, power plant. But the Constitutional Tribunal, uh, since the first cases on the verge of the European law and the constitutions in the, the rulings of uh, the Constitutional Court that was, these were matters uh, from 2003 before Poland joined the European Union. So it was in the um, period of association and since the very beginning, the uh, Constitutional uh, court said that they are the court of last resort and they stressed that uh, the European law is under control of the U constitutional court and in case uh, of issuance of the EU law which is non-compliant, the tribunal would decide on in compliance. The problem is with the implementation. This is a problem that sh deserves a separate discussion, whether the uh, legal consequences of such a ruling, because that's quite simple. Uh, it, when the tribunal says that an act is non-constitutional, it is uh, published, it's not binding, it's not effective, and it's quite simple. But uh, the consequences, legal consequences of um, um, the decision that the EU law is non-constitutional is something more complex. And here I have a real problem of uh, which is scientific in nature. And I'm discussing with other lawyers because, ladies and gentlemen, in the 90s, the Constitutional Commission of the National Assembly was discussing the shape of the Constitution. And there was a stress that the tribunal cannot examine the regulations implementing laws. So there was a strong tendency and the creators of the um, constitutions wanted to formulate it like that, that the tribunal is for the principles of law and not f to decide about rulings. And based on that, uh, the Article 188 was defined about the competence of tribunal to examine acts, international um, agreements, and principles of law issued by central uh, of, uh, national authorities. So these are three cases that can be examined by the Constitutional Tribunal. And I have uh, some problem with that now, because the decision of 7 of October, um, the justification was not present yet. So I can base my opinion only on the press statement that was made or the about the motives of this of this decision. So there was a mention that the Constitutional Tribunal is competent for examination of the European Court of Justice decisions. And I find it troublesome because I cannot see any support confirming that in the Polish Constitution, having in mind what I've said before. I see the Constitution, ladies and gentlemen, above all. I read it like it was read by the people in 1997 when the people voted in, a ref in the referendum. So since the Constitutional Court has this particular remit granted by the Constitution, now if the Court of Justice of the EU um, is creating uh, allegedly competences to itself. That's one thing, but it seems to me that the Constitutional Court, the CC, is um, uh, trying to acquire some additional competences in that respect because the CC has remit to uh, look uh, uh, into the treaties and the uh, regulation, um, secondary regulation based on the treaties. 
but not uh, the um, rulings of the Court of Justice of the EU. This is just an issue that I wanted to raise, and it seems to me that it is going to be more and more um, resurfacing ever, ever more often in publications because this is an important issue. And one more thing, referring to uh, the um, Court of Justice rulings in uh, similar cases. I heard from Professor Gontarski, if I'm not mistaken, let me know if I am, um, that there is no independence of judges in the treaties. The concept is not embedded in the treaties. But I wanted to stress that a primary um, act of law of the Union in the rank of treaties since the Lisbon Treaty ratification is the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, which is an element published in the journal, or the official journal, Article 47, Paragraph 2. Uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU says that every everyone has a right to independent and objective um, case by an independent uh, court. So this is a provision that is uh, no identical in its sense with Article 45 of the Polish Constitution that everybody has right to uh, unbiased uh, uh, case in by an independent court, and I see this independence as a character uh, as universal in its character the professor said an important interesting thing in the previous panel which i had pleasure to be part of redactor sakiewicz rather said in that panel that one of the elements of the legal culture of the first republic of poland was that only a court uh, could s make a sentence in its uh, ruling. And I wanted to refer to that because the acts of the great same, including the Constitution of 3rd May, defined what independence was. That is, namely, uh, that, of course, formulated in the language of the period, but in general, it said that the judge in his ruling should not be under any influence of the executive power. Or rather, the exact formulation was that the executive branch was not to interject in the process of ruling. And uh, that was the concept already in the First Republic of Poland, and that's the a basis of independence of judges. And that concept that the judge, during the process of preparing the ruling, should not be afraid of um, carrying any responsibility in front of the executive branch. This concept is still alive, and that's a basis, a foundation of the Polish Constitution. And that's also a cornerstone of the uh, Lisbon Treaty and the Charter of Fundamental Rights and uh, the European Convention of Human Rights and UN Pacts. That is the minimum of independence is that a judge should not be brought, held responsible in professional terms for making uh, rulings. I do not mean extreme cases, which uh, could be, well, you know, um, uh, court crime, judicial crime. We know such cases from history. That's not, what, not I, what, what I mean. I mean a ruling that can be agreed with or disagreed with. But in any case, such a ruling delivered can be seen as an error because, of course, judges make errors. Some rulings can raise eyebrows and cause up discussion, like the one uh, by the uh, CC uh, that has been discussed recently. I um, 
might not agree with the ruling, but at the same time, I do not agree with the judge carrying personal responsibility for such a ruling. This should be explained in a process of second instance. Because sometimes judges carry responsibility in the form of uh, lack of promotion. There are similar solutions available. Now, last sentence um, about rulings of uh, the Court of Justice of the EU. My legal opinion is that Indeed, the COJ and the European law in general, European Union law, does not refer in any way to the judiciary in Poland because this is out, that's outside of their realm, outside of their remit. Yet, it is a, an intellectual misunderstanding to me to say that the that the rulings of the Court of Justice are an intervention in the judiciary in Poland. That's not a fact, because this presents a certain issue of independence, which is part of the European law, which is written in Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The Court of Justice of the EU is not saying that you cannot have a, a disciplinary chamber in the Supreme Court. That's not it. But it says it's impossible to operate in a shame that poses risks to independence. The COJ said that the system of responsibility of judges in Poland is a threat to independence of judges in Poland. Now, how it should be reorganized is an issue for the Polish legislator, because, of course, the Polish legislator has full rights to organize the judiciary under Article 176, Paragraph 2. That is clearly stated. That's what I see. There is a core of independence, both in the Constitution and the Charter. And to that extent, the standards in terms of constitutional standards are overlapping. And that's what um, the rulings of the COJ are built. Yet COJ rulings should be executed but in line with the Polish Constitution. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, like I said, I'm against the execution of Court of Justice rulings regardless of all conditions. Because that's very controversial from the point of view of trust of the citizen to the state. And the Constitution should definitely have an impact on how the rulings of the COJ are interpreted. Thank you. That's all on my part. Bardzo dziękujemy panu rzecznikowi. Pan profesor. Thank you very much. Waldemar Gontarski has been called. Would you like to comment? Yes, briefly. Article 6, paragraph 2. Indeed, I mentioned that without pointing to uh, particular passages of the Legal Act. It does say that the Charter of Fundamental Rights does not expand the competencies of the institutions of the European Union. That is clearly stated in a provision of the Charter. Therefore, let me stress what I suggested once again, that is more analysis from the point of view of the binding law, which means individual passages of the normative act, that is provisions. And let us not derogate from uh, Article 6, Paragraph 2 where the legislator 
referred to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And again, I ask the question, why is there no independence in the treaties? They are uh, much fresher than the uh, conventions, but I don't want to go back to that. I don't understand where that misunderstanding comes from. Again, okay. thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Time flies, although this discussion is so interesting. I'd like to ask Professor Sadurski. We haven't touched upon an issue today yet. Democracy versus judgeocracy. I remember our conversation with uh, Professor Sadurski and Sir Kochanowski when we were listening uh, in 2009 to the uh, ruling by Scalia. Judge Scalia of the U.S. who warned Europe against judgeocracy and claiming it was a threat to democracy. Professor, as of today, a decade since, are we not observing a bolstering of the process we had been warned against? Well, I myself, in my writing about control of constitutionality of acts of law, warned against the phenomenon you call judgeocracy. This is a, an ongoing discussion in the constitutional theory, particularly in the West, regarding to what extent um, judges should be active and to what extent judges should limit themselves in assessing a parliamentary act of law. The problem in Poland yet is not about a risk of judgeocracy. If we're talking about the role of judges in Poland, it is not a realistic risk that crazy judges might abuse their remedy, their um, power and uh, continually uh, intervene in the rights of the legislator. The problem is different. The problem is that the executive branch in alliance with the legislative is going to persecute these judges in all ways available, and that's what they're doing precisely, giving the Minister of Justice all kinds of personal control over chairpersons of courts, replacing regular operational control, and introduces disciplinary penalties for judges' activities and creating a motivation for a career through a system of delegation where a judge delegated to a higher instance can at any point be relegated to a lower instance or through a whole, whole set of mechanisms in the uh, form of um, special acts of law. We don't, we're not in the luxurious position of Judge Scalia who can, uh, and we cannot uh, allow ourselves to uh, discuss like he did uh, the possibilities of judgeocracy because our issue is quite different. Professor Gontarski asked uh, twice already why treaties do not include uh, judges' independence. I think the answer is quite simple because that's about the rule of law. Nobody would have thought that rule of law can be combined with suspended independence of judges. And this creates a certain framework for this discussion. That is, the notion of rule of law can be blurry and professors can hold discussions on that, but there is a core about which there are no doubts among intelligent reasoning people. Independent judges are a sine qua non 
condition of, of rule of law. I thank Professor. No, none of the authors uh, of the treaties thought that uh, somebody might negate that, so it would be a nice idea to include the independence of judges in Article 2. Simply put, certain things are treated as natural and taken for granted. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, the time has come for a summary and only a minute long. This is the condition I received from the organizers, and there's uh, no negotiation of that. So let's start with the professor. Thank you. I have taken the floor th three times already, and I think, and I think I've expressed myself clearly. We have all to do our best to um, care about the rule of law. Otherwise, anything can be said. And like the professor said, everything seems to be clear because one notion of rule of law can be broken down into a series of values that we see as important. Let's name them. Let's define them. But certain rules have to be clearly stated. The rule of law as such does as a basis for court proceedings makes it difficult to understand things clearly and in detail, particularly if responsibility follows, even if in the form only of imposing duties to drop certain solutions or include other solutions. In my opinion, this is not the right regulation. And if I may refer to what the Ombudsman said, I would be happy to discuss because at a general level from the point of view of rule of law, many things seem obvious. But when we start talking about detailed solutions, these questions become much more complex. Thank you. One more thought to summarize. An element of rule of law is definitely the rule of certainty of law and the legal security of the individual. And from the point of view of this rule, it is difficult for me to accept the fact that one authority can adopt a ruling stating that uh, decisions by another authority of the same state do not exist. That's really hard to accept. A court delivering a ruling stating that a ruling by the uh, Constitutional Court or uh, by a judge uh, from before 2018 is inexistent, that's strange too. Or that the ruling of the European uh, Court uh, of Human Rights does not exist. You know, this is, these are examples of um, an acceptance of uh, individual and uh, mutual com competencies. At the end of the day, the addressee of this kind of ruling is always a human individual. And now treating one authority, one agenda by another according to this mm, uh, rule that is along the lines what that authority did is inexistent from the point of view of legal security and rule of law should be absolutely excluded. Thank you. Professor Sadurski, please summarize. Right, rule of law is two things. It's the rule of legal acts, and secondly, it's, uh, it means that not all power is in the hand of a single man or a single institution. The law cannot be amended as anyone sees fit in their interest. And that is, the law plays a, the role of a certain fixed framework. That's one. And secondly, all power is not concentrated in a single hand. 
there is there is control of the branches of uh, power that is they mutually control one another why like it's defined in the polish constitution that's how i see the rule of law thank you professor Professor Gontarski, it is your turn. Thank you. Picking up on what the Ombudsman said uh, regarding these inexistent rulings, I want to add there are no inexistent provisions of law if they are binding, while they should be primary compared to rulings. So if we go in that direction, more dogmatism, less of all else, then we can understand one another among attorneys much better. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for following this discussion. Many thanks to my panelists. I'm sure this, this debate is going to continue. I hope that what we said today is going to be a starting point for further discussions and will serve as food for thought. Many thanks, Patrick Yaki, for the idea of organizing uh, this intellectual meeting. This is something we really need nowadays. Thank you. Proszę Państwa, teraz dosłownie trzy minuty przerwy, bo zazwyczaj następny panel.